Praise to you. May I speak in the name of God who created, redeemed, and sustains us. Amen. Please be seated wherever you are. So we had that wonderful reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah in the year that King Uzziah died. It's very grand. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Whenever I hear that reading, I'm reminded of my ordination as a deacon, which took place, I think, 26 years ago. Goodness me, how time flies. It was in Southern Cathedral. And I remember waiting in the north aisle. We were all in the, in the procession waiting to go in. And actually, I was wearing this stole, but I wasn't quite because I hadn't been ordained yet, but I was about to put it on. So I'm wearing it today as a kind of memory of that. And there was a moment where right at the beginning of the service, the, audience, the organ struck up with the entrance anthem, which was, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord, the great anthem by Parry. And the organ starts with its most dramatic chords. And I remember all the hairs standing up on the back of my neck and everywhere as they are now. So I remember that extraordinary event. It's an amazing way to start a job, really, to be ordained as a deacon. And there you are in the cathedral with these other people. It's, it's remarkable. But it's not dissimilar to what happened to the prophet Isaiah, this description of these extraordinary things. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. There's the whole, they're trying to, the, the writer, the prophet is trying to express the inexpressible, and he does it by using these incredibly powerful images. But what lies behind it? What lies behind this reading? Today is Trinity Sunday. And traditionally, what the clergy do on Trinity Sunday is they preach about how difficult it is to preach about the Trinity. I'm not sure that we don't make rather heavy weather of the Trinity. It doesn't seem to me to be nearly as complicated as we kind of pretend it is. And whenever, whenever I think of the Trinity, I think of that great, very famous icon by Andre Rublev of the three people sitting around the table. It's the three angels when we went to see Abraham. They're all on a level. They're all relating to each other. And there's a cup in the middle, chalice, the communion. And they're all in relationship. And surely the key point about the Trinity is A, that it's a mystery, and B, that it's about relationship. It's about the relationship at the heart of the Godhead. The relationship is three, so it's dynamic. The relationship is always changing, always equal, always new and fundamentally founded in love. That's all you really need to know about the Trinity. I don't know why everyone's got so stuck on it. And here it is in the reading from the Gospel of John. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So the two key words in that passage for me are loved and saved. Loved and saved. Loving and saving. Love is the way. I made a podcast this week for an organisation called Lambeth Links, which has been set up by a very creative young man called Chris to develop the connections between the LGBTI community and Lambeth. Apparently Lambeth has the highest incidence of LGBTI people in the country. And it was really nice to be able to make a podcast that's gonna go out next month. And as part of it, I kind of found myself saying that it was a real privilege to be part of an organization which exists for only one purpose, which is to love. It was a real privilege to be part of something which is here for the sole and individual purpose of loving. Perhaps we don't always achieve it, perhaps we fall short, but our, our ideal, and I know that Eva and John is here. Eva, it's lovely to see you. Eva created and oversaw the whole process of living in love and faith, which many of us have been involved in over the past few months. We are an organization which is here in order to live in love and faith. 
William Temple said, who was an Archbishop of Canterbury back in the 1940s, he said, the church is the only organization that exists purely for the benefit of those who are outside it. I'm not sure if that's not a slight oversimplification, but you get what he's saying, don't you? We exist for other people. We exist to love the world. And Martin Luther King said, the establishment of justice can only be by the embodiment of love. The establishment of justice can only be by the embodiment of love. But how can this be? How can this be? How can people not perish but have eternal life? How can people be saved through Jesus Christ here and now in the 20, 21st century in Waterloo? Well, let's refer back to the gospel reading. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. I warned to Nicodemus, he came by night because he didn't want to provoke scandal, perhaps, because he was afraid, because he knew that he was going outside what he should be doing as a Pharisee. He knew that he was walking into danger. But he went because he was wanting to understand this thing that he was hearing. He was wanting to make sense of this message which he was being told about, perhaps because of people on the street. And he goes and asks him, and they have this detailed conversation in which you know, he doesn't really understand what's happening. And at one point, Jesus, you can see him saying, well, you're a leader, surely you get it. And then he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. So how can that happen here and now? How can that be made present? Well, again, we look at the reading from Isaiah. Then the seraph touched my mouth and with it touched my mouth with this and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. So we don't have Nicodemus anymore. But there are other people who might come to Jesus by night or in the day, to try to understand this message that they're hearing. And those other people are us, you and me, the church. We are the body of Christ. And as such, we have a vocation. We have a calling. Here I am, send me. We all have a vocation. And we all have a place, for we are all the body of Christ. I'm reminded of the famous prayer of Teresa of Avila. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks in compassion on the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, Yours are the eyes, yours are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So we tend to think of vocation only in terms of the priesthood within the church. Oh, you have a vocation, that means you're going to be ordained. That's wrong. Because the highest calling, the highest vocation of each of us is to become the people that we were created to be. For some of us, that means becoming priests. For most of us, it doesn't. Thank goodness, you might say. It's all about us not being afraid to be who we are. To love the people that we're given to love. To have the courage to celebrate the life that we have been given. So let me reiterate, everyone has a vocation. Everything has a vocation. Every bird, every flower, every tree, every animal, every living thing. Wasps and bees and tigers and whales all have a vocation to be the best wasp or bee or tiger or whale that they can possibly be. Within the church, we all have different vocations. One of us might be a lawyer, one might be a cleaner, 
a nurse, a mother, a grandfather, a daughter, a partner, a teacher, a banker, a painter, a carer, an artist. Within the church, we have different vocations. Some of us sing, some of us read, some of us preach, some of us do the IT, some of us are spas, some of pastoral auxiliaries, some of us are lay readers. We're all called in different ways to serve this great commandment of love. And also, every building has a vocation as well to be the best building it can be for the people it serves. You might not be surprised to, say, to hear me say that, but this building has a vocation. And we're in the process of helping it to live out its vocation better, to be the best place that it can possibly be for the people of Waterloo and London, to be a place of worship and wonder. As I wrote this yesterday, there was a choir rehearsing in the churchyard and Waterloo was filled with the sound of the anthem, Beati Corum Via, blessed are those who walk in the way of the Lord. And in the churchyard, we have the wonderful Respair postcards, which have been sent to us from all over the world, wishing us well as we move into the next stage of our pilgrimage. And here in church, you can't see it if you're online, but here in church, we have some wonderful artwork, which has been made by the Over 50s Club at Coin Street, which is creating their version of what it means to have hope through despair. So these are all different ways in which this place and this community lives out its vocation. So then, of course, the question is, what's yours? What's your vocation? How do you respond to those words of the prophet Isaiah? Here I am, send me. How are you being called? What would help you to be more the person you want to be? Or what perhaps are you avoiding? Now I look out, and I look at the congregation, I look at the choir, I look at the people online, and I know that you're all doing lots of things. And many of you are tired, and perhaps you're thinking, oh, do I really have to think about my vocation again? To which I say, fantastic. What you're doing already is wonderful. And I know that many of, us, many of you do many, many things. But we never stop growing. We stop growing, we die. We never stop changing. So the question is always asked, isn't it? How can we respond to that calling? Here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. What's next in the journey? Do not be afraid says Jesus over and over again in the gospel. Do not be afraid. Are we afraid sometimes of using our gifts? Are we afraid sometimes of the pilgrimage that we're about to go on as we leave this building and we move into the wilderness south of the cut for 10 months? Are we afraid to hear the call? Are we afraid to respond? There's a great poem by George Herbert, who's one of our favorite poets here, I think. It's called The Collar. And I think he must have written it when he was resisting his vocation. It starts, I struck the board and cried, no more, I will abroad. What, shall I ever sigh and pine? He's really saying, no, I just don't want this. And it goes on for line after line after line, saying, yes, there is wine, and can I not just enjoy it? And then at the end it says, but as I raved and grew more fierce and wild at every word, methought I heard one calling child. And I replied, my Lord. So I think it's a real challenge. And let me end with it. Let me ask you, what is your vocation now? What are you being called to do? If it's something in the church, by all means talk to me, or to one of the other clergy, or to one of the lay people around. There are lots of things we can do together, collectively, in the church and individually. And if it's something outside, something which might move you slightly outside your comfort zone, maybe, or something else that you want to take on, that you feel you're being called to take on, then do it. Do not be afraid 
said Jesus. Do not be afraid to celebrate the gifts that we've received. And so I'll finish where I started with the prophet Isaiah. And as I read those last lines from that passage, I invite you to put yourselves in the shoes of the prophet, to imagine that God is talking to you and listen to what God is saying. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, here I am. Send me.